They do all about trains. Hostler, a workman who services locomotives between runs. for All About Trains, Chuck Daly. You saw this diesel locomotive come out of the engine house. Today, we're going to talk about what moved it from the house to where it is now, power and control for model railroading. It takes certain controls to make this piece of equipment move. To help me explain that today is the Vice President of Operations for the Arkansas and Louisiana Missouri Railroad, Mr. Herman Wilson. Herman, where do we start? Let's get in the cab truck, and I can show you how the actual instruments work. Okay. All right, Chuck, here we are in the driver's seat. All the instruments on the locomotive are all compactly located right here where the engineer can, can reach anything without thinking he has to operate from reflexes a lot of times. All the instruments are handy for him to reach. First thing you'd want to do in moving, of course, would be to put the engine in gear. That's done with this little reversing lever. You put it, push it in reverse to back up, push it in forward to go ahead. It's just that simple. We'll push it in reverse. Then you have your throttle, and to, to make the engine move, all you do is Riding out on the throttle. What, that the this, brake? this brake here just operates the brakes on the locomotive. And if you just have a light engine, that's what you would use. This is your train brake. And to uh, control the train, you draw up air with this brake as much as you need. You have gauges here that tell you how much air you've got, how much you're drawing off. And to release the air. Also, this is your emergency brake lever for an emergency stop. You pull this lever all the way around to the last notch. That puts, dumps all the air out of your brake cylinders on all your cars on your train, also the locomotive, and puts the sanders in operation on the locomotive. When you do that, you usually hold your brake lever down on your locomotive. That keeps your wheels from sliding because if you let them slide with the sand, then you're gonna flatten the wheels and ruin them and have to change them all out. This is the sanding unit that you use when you're pulling a heavy train. You would, you would apply sand to the rails, either backing up or going forward. If you're working in a congested area, you have a, an automatic bell ringer, runs by air. You use the bell also when you're going along road crossing. Of course, you have your, your whistle cord. Is that and then, operated by steam or air? No, it's operated by air. Then you also, uh, an integral part of your instruments in operation is your radio. All modern locomotives have a radio and you can hardly operate without them. You have a, a few instruments, gauges, mostly water, oil pressure, that's the two you'd be. But the air pressure gauges are the most important. They're located right here where the engineer has has them in his eye all the time. And that just about covers the whole gamut of the instruments you use to control the train. In the real world, throttles are controlled by mechanical devices that run locomotives. In the model world, electrical devices control locomotives. They're called power packs. With me today to help explain what power packs are is Richard Camp. 
Richard, where do we begin? Well, Chuck, probably the easiest place to begin is to look at the powering of your layout, just as the early model railroaders had to do. One of the earliest forms was simply this. If you grab the string, you pull the locomotive along behind you. This was the earliest form of power, if you will, for a model railroad. Another early form was like this, where you pull the locomotive along. Now, obviously, this is a fairly limited way to power your locomotive or your model railroad, and after a while would lose a little of the real special flair that goes with model railroading. So let's put these aside and take a look at a modern, modern day railroad set. A set like this might have things such as a locomotive, cars, and you notice a device in the lower corner labeled a power pack. Sometimes these are labeled throttles, other times power packs. They are power supplies for your model railroad. Let's take a look at the power pack from this train set and see what some of the features are. First, notice that there's an AC line cord. This plugs into the receptacles at your house. One thing to notice is that there is no on-off switch, so whenever you plug it in, the power pack or transformer is active. Therefore, never plug it in until you're ready to use it. Likewise, whenever you've finished using it, immediately unplug it. Secondly, notice that there are special devices so that you can't open this device, this power pack. Whenever you have problems, take it back to your local hobby shop or your dealer where you bought the train set and have a representative of the company repair it rather than try to fix it yourself. This device represents a true potential shock hazard. It can hurt or potentially kill someone, so never mess with it. Let a professional work on it. Number two, notice a series of screws or terminal strips up here, and these are divided into two sets. The first is labeled DC or track only. This is the part we'll connect to our railroad. The second is labeled AC or accessories only. This might be for some lights or other things that you would like to have on your layout. And we'll discuss the applications and uses of this in a later segment of the series. Right now, let's take a section of track that I brought with me and set it up as our theoretical railroad. We'll take two wires from the two rails and connect them to the terminal strip at the point marked DC track only. Again, don't plug in the power pack until you've completed these connections. With that done, we can take our locomotive and place it on the track. Now we'll take our AC line cord and plug it in to our power in the house current. If we take at this point and use the two controls on the front. The first is marked speed, and it has two positions, stop and full. This obviously will control how fast the locomotive runs. The second switch is marked direction, and just as the reverser that Mr. Wilson talked about allows your locomotive to go either forward or reverse. Let's put our direction switch in and open up our throttle. Notice it runs in one direction. If we reverse our direction switch, we can control how fast or how slow this locomotive moves. Changing the direction switch and using the speed switch. These are the two basic parts of any throttle, speed and direction. Chuck, on my way over today, I brought several other power packs or throttles. Let's take a look at them. And I don't mean to really be endorsing any particular product or saying any one is better than the other. I just took a few off the hobby shop shelf to show you what's available. This is the first step up from your common train set power pack. Notice we have an AC line cord, which again plugs in. And on the top, we have a series of terminal strips, much like we saw in the previous power pack. Again, these are for the track for your AC accessories, and this one has a one labeled fixed DC, which would be for some other special accessories. But let's take a look at the front. First of all, there's now an on-off switch, which we didn't have in our train set power pack, a little added safety feature. This is our speed device. It sits in the white area, and the numbers give you an idea of the relative speed that your train will move. 
Here's our reverser. It's now labeled direction and simply has an arrow pointing in either direction. But there are two new switches. The first is momentum, off or on. When Mr. Wilson was showing you the real locomotive, he mentioned that the train doesn't start immediately. It takes a while for the engine to move and get the generators going and get the power going. This is to simulate that effect. With momentum turned on, your train doesn't start immediately, but it gradually picks up speed and moves along. The other new switch is labeled brake, and it will fall back as soon as we press it, but it allows us to slowly tap the brakes. So just as with the real locomotive, you can control the speed, but you can apply the brakes separately. So this is the next step up from your train set power pack. Let's take a look at another throttle or power pack I brought along. This is a, another step up, a little more advanced form. Let's look for similarities first. Here's our good old friend, the AC line cord. On the back, we again have terminal strips, but they're a little different in this model. In this case, these are plugs where you actually plug into these. It's an added safety feature. You can't accidentally touch those and produce electrical shock or electrical hazard. Again, one should always treat these as electronic instruments and treat them with respect. The possibility of electrical shock is always there. It can cause injury or potentially death. On the front, we see a lot more controls. The switch right in the middle, the orange switch, is our old friend, the on-off switch. Power on, power off. We see a set of controls over here, numbered number one, and a set over here, number two. What we actually have is two of the previous power packs put into one box. So we have the same controls. We have the speed control, we have direction, we have momentum, and we have our braking functions. The same controls as before, but now two of these are put together, so you have the potential for running two different locomotives off the same power pack or throttle. The little lights merely indicate the different functions, and they come on when, when it's plugged in and the functions are applied. So another step up. Now let's take a big leap up to near the top of the line. In this type of power pack, we're going to see a number of additional functions. Let's look for the familiar things. We have, first of all, our on-off switch for general power. We have our speed controller. And we have our direction controller. Now, in this case, there's a switch labeled transmission. This is our momentum effect that we looked at before, the slow startup and stop of the locomotive. It has another switch which has been added called pulse power. And this allows for better control at slow speeds. You don't get that jerky jackrabbit effect with your locomotive when you try to start it up. We also have the direction switches here, both for the main line and for a potential reverse loop. It's a little more advanced wiring problem that some modelers go into. These can all be controlled individually by these knobs. We also have another function, though. That's the brake. If you remember, Mr. Wilson talked about there are several different brake positions that one can use in a real, real train locomotive. We can just run, coast. We can put on the service brake, quick service, which is a little faster stop. Or if we have a real problem, we can throw on the emergency brake, immediately dump the air, if you will, and stop our train. So we can now work the brake in many different functions, just as in the real locomotive. Notice up here, two gauges which let us monitor the track voltage and the track amperage, the amount of current being drawn by the locomotives. Now that we've looked at our power packs all the way from the simple train set up to a fairly sophisticated model, let's see what we could do with our power packs. We'll set this aside and we'll go back to our basic layout. If you remember, we have one locomotive which we can control the speed, and the direction. But what happens if we take a second locomotive and place it on the same track? Now if we up our speed, they both move in the same direction and at approximately the same speed. This would be fine if we want to have one train follow right along behind the other, but if you wanted to control one of these, it'd be a little difficult. There's not much we could do to really run these separately. Now one way to do that would be to merely take and build a second layout 
which we'll represent with a second piece of track. I've got a second power supply here. We'll connect it to our piece of track. Then we'll plug in our throttle, power pack. Always remember to make your connections before plugging anything in. Now, if I take this black locomotive and move it over here, you'll be able to control its speed and direction with your power pack. And I'll be able to control the other unit with my power pack. Now we have the fundamental unit for independent train control. This is block control. You have an electrical block, and I have an electrical block. They are totally separated, mm -hmm. and each powered by its own power pack transformer. These could be side by side, as we have them here, or they could be placed end to end. Mm -hmm. So the basic block concept of operation is used by many hobbyists or modelers. Now what happens if you want to control this locomotive and then I want to control this locomotive? We have a little bit of a problem right now. We could undo my terminal strips and undo yours and switch them back and forth real quick and change them around. But let me show you another way we could potentially do that. First, let's unplug our units. And let's just take this section out of the way and work with our single track section. I prepared a little switch before I came by today. And this is a, just for example, because of the size of it, most hobbyists would actually use a switch like this, a small toggle switch to make these connections. But for ease of showing it, we're going to use this big switch. Let's take the output from your power pack and connect it to one side of our knife switch. We're going to now take the output from my power pack and we'll move them over to the other side of our knife switch. This could be a toggle switch, as I showed before. If you wanted to use more than two power packs, that could easily be a rotary switch, which would allow you to dial in any number of different power packs. Now lastly, we'll take the two center connections and connect them to our track. Now at this point, we have my throttle connected to one side of the knife switch, your throttle connected to the other side of the knife switch, and the output of the knife switch attached to the track. Let's plug our units back in. First of all, notice the knife switch is in the center position, so neither power pack should be connected to our locomotive. If you try your power pack, no effect. If I try mine, no effect. Let's connect the knife switch to my power pack by closing it on this side. Now notice that the white wire is closed through. And at this point, mm -hmm. I can control the direction and speed of my locomotive. But try your power pack. Nothing. No effect. Nope. Let's reverse the knife switch so that you now have control of the locomotive. Ah, sure do. But now my power pack has no effect. I can't make it run. No, nope, but mine is and yours isn't. In any, any direction at all. So a way to control electrical blocks using in this case a knife switch in a real railroad, a real model railroad, we would use the toggle switches or rotary switches. Now again, this works fine, but it has several limitations. You have to have definite electrical blocks. There have to be definite places where locomotives can be. Again, if I put the second locomotive in the same block, the only effect is that you now control both locomotives. Mm -hmm. You can't do that independently. Oh, I see. What we need is a more advanced method of train control, and one has recently come on the market that I'd like to talk with you about for a few moments. Let's unplug these devices first. That is command control or carrier control. In this system, the track carries not only the power to the locomotive, but also carries commands or special signals to the locomotives to give it the information for speed and direction. Now, obviously, the locomotives in this case have to be modified slightly so that they can receive these special commands or signals. But the layout can now be one large piece of track. You no longer have to use the concept of electrical blocks. You have the entire track as one system, and there are signals or commands sent down the track. 
On the way over today, I stopped by my local hobby shop and picked up a couple of these systems. I'd like to show them to you. I'm not endorsing any particular brand. Again, these just happen to be the ones that were on the shelf. This first one is kind of the first step into command control. In this system, you can run one locomotive as a standard power pack, standard locomotive. The other will have a special device installed known as a receiver. This looks very much like the previous throttles we saw. The AC line cord, plugs on the back for track and accessories, and the front controls for speed, in this case here and here, and direction. The only change will be that one locomotive runs on standard power, just as these do. The other has this special receiver installed and runs by receiving commands down the rail. So this is the first step up. A more sophisticated system has been introduced from Europe. I have this system uh, one. known as the Hornbeat 01 system. This is a more advanced system. It works on a computer. Actually sitting inside this device. Let's see what's familiar first and then we'll look at what's different. AC line cord, plugs on the back for track and accessories. Looks like a standard power pack. Here's a speed controller, and here are two buttons marked forward and reverse. A main switch to turn the whole thing on and off. But here are a series of buttons in which we can specify which locomotive we want to control. In this system, each of the locomotives is equipped with a special small receiver that receives the commands sent out from this command and power module. Now, additional modules can be plugged on the end, or you can add on a device such as this, which gives you some ability to walk around your layout. This long tether contains on the end, again, a device for speed and direction. The use of a computer system for commands. Now, this has gotten pretty sophisticated, and likewise pretty expensive. But I'd like to show you one other alternative that gives you the positive features of command control without the necessary high cost. This is a system that you can build yourself. It was described in one of the Model Railroad magazines and is known as the CTC-16 system. That's centralized train control 16 because you can control up to 16 locomotives at one time. The kits you build yourself, this one I picked up from the uh, Central Station Model Railroad Club in Shreveport. They built it there. It comes as two parts, an upper command station and a lower power station. These are connected together by a single cable. On the back are a series of terminals for connecting two specific locomotives. Inside each locomotive, is a small receiver module, such as this one, that a member of the club has built up. This is fine for steam tenders. This type of receiver is also available, and this can go into your diesel units. I'd like to take a moment and show you how this works, utilizing a couple of the units off of my layout. I'm going to attach this to our layout here, our little section of track that we've been using. I'm going to pick up the speed controllers. Now these work just like your common throttles. They have two controls on them, one for direction and one for speed. I brought two of them along. I'm going to let you have that one. One of the minor problems is little wires tangling up together. First of all, we need to take our present locomotives off. If we leave them on there and turn the system on, they'll merely take off in one direction and probably run off the end of the table. So let's just set them aside. And I brought along a couple of locomotives from my layout. They're equipped with the CTC receivers so that they can interpret the commands or signals that are sent down the track. Now, if I take my speed device, set the direction, and slowly advance the speed, I can move my locomotive along. Now, if I reverse direction, I can run it in the reverse area, just like a standard power pack. Not much of an advantage, huh? But remember what happened previously when we set a second locomotive on there? I'm going to take this locomotive from a friend of mine, Dave Vital, 
and set it on the track. It's also equipped with a CTC-16 receiver. You see, you can put it in a fairly small locomotive. Now, in this case, I'm going to turn up my speed control, and my engine moves, but Dave's doesn't. It sits on the track waiting for its command or signal. It's not received it at this point. It so happens that your box is set up to run that locomotive, so if you take your speed and direction controls and move them, now you can control it. Notice that you can get really incredibly slow speed mm -hmm. out of a system like this. If you reverse the direction switch, you'll see that your unit reverses, yet mine has not received a signal at this point or a command to move. So each locomotive receives only its specific signals or commands. We've gone from a simple standard train set with a very basic power pack through several different grades of sophistication in power packs all the way up to those that have gauges or meters to allow us to monitor the functions. Then we've looked at really the state of the art, the most advanced systems around, the command or carrier control systems. We've looked at a, a hybrid system that lets you run standard locomotives with specially equipped locomotives. We've looked at a computerized system which uses special receivers. And we've looked at a home built system, a hobbyist type system where you build everything yourself you put special receivers in the locomotives, and they receive the commands or signals. This time, we looked at power and control. Now that we have the basic understandings of laying track, putting down switches, and how to power our locomotive, we're going to take a look at some of the rolling stock, basically motive power. Next week, we take a look at steam. For lively discussion tonight at 11, turn to Late Night America. Russian journalist Vladimir Posner talks about his book. Last time on All About Trains, we talked about power and control for model railroads, power packs, basically. Now that we know how to put together a train layout and we've got our power, now we need motive power. So this time on All About Trains, we're going to talk about steam engines. With me to explain the basics of steam engines and some history of steam engines in the United States is Paul Harwell. Paul, basically, what do you do when you think about steam engines? Where do you start? Well, you may as well start at the beginning, Chuck. The first steam locomotive that was built for railroad operation was built over in England in 1802. This was the first steam locomotive, but it wasn't a successful design. It was way too heavy for the track surface of those days. Uh, up until the 1815, uh, 1820, uh, locomotives of several different designs and several different mechanics and designers had all their own different concept of what a steam locomotive should be. And it was in its infancy stage, so everybody was right in their own little way. It wasn't until 1829 when a man named Robert Stevenson combined all of these appliances into one, uh, one locomotive design. This was the famous rocket design that won the Rainhill Trials and began to be produced uh, for the first railroad in England. The first locomotive that ran in the United States was, of course, the, Baltimore, the Tom Thumb of the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad. This was the first one that pulled a train in the United States. From here, basically, these first locomotives were what might be called a platform type. They looked somewhat like a hand car or just a wood platform that had four driving wheels that were connected to the steam locomotive, which either had a horizontal or a vertical boiler mounted on the platform. Uh, as the designs got more and more refined, a uh, leading truck, which is a pair of wheels in front, helped guide it into curves and through curves, was added. It was also learned that this, these lead wheels, or pilot wheels as they're called, could support part of the weight of a locomotive, and thus it could be larger and more powerful. Uh, through these years, up until the 1840s, 1850s, was basically the developmental years of the steam locomotive. Uh, steam locomotives from about 1865 to 1890, this is the golden year of the iron horse. Locomotives of the basic types, which were the 440 American Standard Type, or American for short, the 260 steam locomotive, which was called a mogul type, and the 
280 consolidation type. What these classifications and numbers mean, this is a white classification for a locomotive. It was developed by a Dr. White many, many years ago. It's a system of classifying the different types of steam locomotive wheel arrangements so you can identify the individual types. A 280 consolidation type locomotive it, it refers to two pilot wheels in front of the locomotive guided into the curves, non-powered, eight driving wheels, and then zero trailing wheels. So then this the is white, a 280. That's just the basic wheel arrangement. That's then. just our basic way of identifying these locomotives. It's the most standardized. Okay, from here, uh, the freight trains got longer and heavier, and the schedules were improved to where they were faster. Steam locomotives had to expand, become larger, have bigger capacity for steaming capability and running as far as speed. Uh, the locomotives grew larger and larger until about the turn of the century, they were about as far as they could go in their present form. Okay. Right now, I'd like to show you how a basic steam locomotive operates and all the parts on a steam locomotive. We have a diagram back here, which uh, we can do just that. Okay, let's take a look at it. Chuck, here's our diagram. Let me show you how a steam locomotive works. We don't show it here, but back here is the coal car or tender. This carries the water, which is heated and made into steam, which makes the train operate, and it carries the fuel, whether it be wood, coal, or oil. The fuel is put into the firebox, and it is burned. This creates heat, goes through these tubes here, which are called flues. This is the boiler right here. It's completely injected full of water. When the heating surface goes through these tubes or flues, it heats up the water, making it evaporate into steam. Okay, the exhaust fumes come into what is called the smoke box and are exhausted out the smokestack, the chimney. Okay, the water, as I said, is heated into steam. It rises to the top into the steam dome. There is a throttle valve up here, which is uh, controlled by the throttle by the engineer in the cab. He opens this valve. This lets uh, active steam into this tube. It is forced into the pistons, into the cylinders. This forces the piston rod back and forth. Okay, this, after it has been uh, forced the piston, it exhausts out and up through this same exhaust tube, pulling with it the exhaust gases out the stack. Okay, this uh, steam forces a back and forth action. This is connected to a main rod here. It turns the wheels around and around. There's four exhausts for one revolution. 